Hello, good morning, Rajesh. Hello. Hello, yeah, good morning. I'm um, Vinod yeah, yeah. from Excelitics. Oh, welcome to Excelitics SQL training. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just waiting for the few more to join. So, yeah, yeah. So, we'll be starting.
Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Excelitics. So, thanks for joining this session on SQL database. So, are you all able to hear me? So normally uh, we expect all of you to be on mute, but whenever you want to talk, you can just click on the mic button, unmute and speak out if you want to have any questions. And then you can uh, again mute yourself. Okay, try to be on mute so that we'll not be disturbing the others. And also video is not necessary because it will slow down the network and you may find some lag in the discussion. So normally we just, switch off the video i'll be sharing my screen so our discussions will be based on the actual tool itself so we'll be mostly working on the sql server using my screen okay so today we are here to discuss and understand about the database, particularly the RDBMS databases like SQL. Okay, so why we are here is that's the reason why we should learn SQL Server. That is because I assume all of you are expecting to work on data analysis or MIS reporting. Okay, management information system, some sort of reporting, wherein we want to pick up the data existing, saved by somebody some of our colleagues or some of the clients, and we want to present it in a meaningful way. So let's understand why data analytics is so important and what is the importance of database, understanding the database, why is it important in a, any of the applications, okay? So before proceeding further, let me introduce myself. My name is Vinod. For more than 15 years, I've been working on different database or reporting activities. Okay, so I worked on Crystal Reports, Excel, Excel Macros, Power BI, ClickView. And as a backend is mostly SQL Server or Oracle. So these are my different uh, areas where I have worked on. Yeah, Mr. Ramesh, do you want to say anything? Mr. Ramesh? A lot of noise is coming from your side, but I'm not able to hear anything. Please be on mute. And if you want to say anything, you can use your chat window also. So to avoid disturbance, I would prefer that all of you, whatever you want to say, you can put it in the chat window. Okay. So uh, I've done certifications in Excel, Crystal Reports, as well as Power BI. Yeah. Hello, Ramesh. Hello, Ramesh. You are creating disturbance here. We are not able to hear anything from you. What is the problem? Hello, Ramesh. Thank you. 
हेलो ओके सो दिस बेसिकली ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन अबाउट माय सेल्फ सो हैविंग वर्कड ऑन डिफरेंट प्लेटफॉर्म्स आई वुड लाइक टू शेयर माय एक्सपीरियंसेस विद यू एंड लेट यू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ टू वर्क विद द सर्वर्स आल्सो एसक्यूएल डेटाबेसेस so i am assuming that you already have some basic knowledge on excel or understand what is data okay can any of you please tell me what you understand by the word data so that we can understand what is data analysis before that let's understand what is data so just in your own words you can just say what is you understand by the word data You can type in the chat window, or you can unmute and just speak. so what is data information okay sign is says it is data means information right it's quite near to that anything else basically whatever we put into our systems whether it's a computer database or a excel file or in fact even your mobile phone you save lot of numbers four numbers of all your friends and relatives everything is a data okay whatever we store into the systems it is we call it as a data so data could be a structured form or it could be very simple just like a mobile numbers or it could be an excel sheet we have worked on excel okay can i assume that all of you are having basic knowledge of excel so when we fill in data into the excel that is also a data okay but as our requirements increases we want to utilize this data to understand what's happening in the organization okay like supposing there is a shopping mall selling different products they very often ask you for your mobile number nothing more just a mobile number they will ask us and in the system they are going to save okay this person what is the pattern of his purchases what is he buying so from the data he can dig in and see how often this person is coming to us for purchases what is the general products he is buying based on that they can send us a targeted messages that means whenever similar products come into market or new products have come in they will send us message or any festival dhamaka like that any of the features are coming up functions are there they will send us a message saying that so much discounts are there you can come and buy so they use our number for marketing same way lot of information available in the lot of data i would say lot of data available in our systems you can utilize for the improvement of the business to make right decisions for the future so that's what we call it as data analysis converting the raw data into 
some meaningful information that can help in decision making. That means next year, which product you should give discount and encourage sales? Because which product is giving you more profit? Or which customers, which type of customers are coming as, as frequently? All these things we can understand by analyzing our data available with us. Okay. And this data will be utilized like the basic high level steps I can say are taking this data, converting into information. That means extracting meaningful data from the information. Picking up the important data, like when you're saving the data, you might be saving the customer name, address, phone number, the product, product details, and who has manufactured that product. All the information might be there, but what we want for the analysis, we are going to pick up from the raw data. So what we select it and use it in our reporting, we call it as the information, something meaningful out of the raw data, okay? This information is again summarized to see like say monthly sales or region-wise sales you want to know, branch-wise sales, such you can summarize the data that is available as a form of information. Further, this summarized data is converted into visualizations, put it in graphical presentation so that we can easily understand and analyze the data. Okay, these are the basic things we are going expected to do with the data we store. So understand data stored in the system is not just for uh, taking an invoice printout or taking a ledger, but more than that, we can analyze the data and use it for our future planning. So this data could be available in different forms. Some of us must be already working on Excel reports or some other applications. So where the data is stored, when you store the data in a systematic way, we call it as a database management system. Because when you want to retrieve it and use it, you have to store it in a proper way, such a way that you can easily get some meaningful inferences from them. Like say, supposing in Excel, in Excel you might be storing lots of information, but where are you getting the data? From where are you getting this data into the Excel? Is it directly documented into the Excel or is it coming from some other system? We use many applications to save the data into the computer. It could be a tally, could be some .NET applications, customized applications. There are different ways of storing the data into the database. And that is, has to be managed properly. You cannot save everything into an Excel because Excel has certain limitations. It can store maximum 10 lakh rows per sheet. And also if you put everything into a single sheet, it becomes very inefficient to pick up the data. So as the data increases and also to help the different applications save data, we have the concept called database, okay? The database basically is a managed system of storing the data, wherein data is stored in the form of multiple tables. It is distributed. Instead of putting everything into a single Excel sheet, we are going to put the data into multiple sheets based on the related information. Like say, supposing customer information, we want to put it in one place, product information in one page, addresses in one page, day-to-day -day information. Like supposing you open a mobile, you see so many applications. Your phone contacts will be at one place. Your WhatsApp messages will be in one folder. All your photos, important photos, you are going to put it in one folder. Like this, even in the data should be stored in multiple locations so that it can be easily retrieved. So this is the process in which data storage is managed properly. So we call it as a database management system, wherein data is stored in the form of different tables. So we are going to understand in detail now, what is a table, how it is stored and other things, okay? And 
the SQL or structured query language. This is the language used to communicate with the data. Okay. If it is a normal Excel file or a text file, you might be directly opening and seeing the data within that Excel. Okay. Directly you will open the Excel file, see what is there in that Excel file. But when it comes to a bigger database, so data cannot be directly just viewed as it is. You can't open the data directly because it is going to be very huge and it's going to take a lot of time to view the data. Instead of that, we are going to use a specific language to interact with the data. In any database, we are going to use a specific language to interact with the data. And then get the information that is required from this. So a database is basically a collection of objects, data objects, or we can say tables, views, where data is stored, okay? That is a useful where you want to retrieve data from a bigger set of data. As the data increases, now we can see a few cases where it is going to be GB or even PB of data, terabytes of data will be there. When you want to retrieve it, you should have an easy mechanism to get only what you want to see from that. So that's done using the SQL. SQL full form is structured query language. This is a language used, just how we write VB code, VBA code to read Excel file, do some calculations on that. Same way, SQL is the standard language used to interact with the databases. And the good thing about SQL is that it is not specific to only Microsoft SQL Server. The same standard language is used in Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, or any of the databases. Everything uses the common language called SQL. Full form is structured query language, or in a short form, it is also called, pronounced as SQL, SQL or SQL or structured query language, everything is same. This is the language through which we're going to interact with the data stored in a database. Okay, the main purpose here is that, unlike an Excel file or a text file, we are not going to directly open the database and see. We are instead going to connect and pick up only the data that we want to see. And to make, to standardize this, EF called as conceived certain rules. He said that if any database follows the standard 13 rules that are proposed by EF called, then we can call it as a relational database management system. So basically the purpose of having that is, like I'll show, compare it with an Excel. Okay, so that we can understand why data should be stored in multiple tables. What is the necessary to have a relational database instead of having a simple Excel file like this? What is the advantage? Let us see. Say for example, this is the data available with us having different information about the sales. Sales of a supposing a retail office is a retail shop is there. These are the different sales information. Okay. I can put everything into a single table, single Excel sheet so that we can create different charts. I can store the order information, order date. Okay, who is the customer? What is his name, address? His, what is the product he's purchasing? At what price he has purchased quantity? Everything we can put in a one place. This is ideally, this is the way we would like to have it to create a chart, to create a report. But what happens here when you store everything at one place, a lot of information is getting duplicated. Same information we are storing at multiple places. Like this customer, Yange might have come to us for four or five times. Every time we are storing what type of customer is, what is his address, what is his 
postal code, what is the region, everything we are repeating. While duplicating this, unnecessarily we are storing a lot of information and there is also chance of ambiguity. Same customer name, we might be storing one place as a staying in Scottsdale and at that time we might be saying that he's the same person storing in San Diego. So like this, if we store the information, it may not be useful for the right reporting. We'll be showing the same person at two different cities. So our sales also gets duplicated and we'll be reporting on the wrong values. To avoid such problem, always data should be stored separately. Only related data should be stored at a place. Like here, a customer is there. We can store the customer, his name and address in one location. It could be a sheet of Excel sheet or a table of a database. So here we are going to refer each customer by a unique ID. Like how we have a login ID or an employee ID. Same way each customer will be given one unique ID. And this supposing JA11006 is there. This always refers to this particular customer and his updated latest address is given here. Okay. So in when he does any transaction with us, we are going to store only his ID, customer ID and the product ID. So based on the product ID, I can know which product he has purchased because we have a product master. Wherein based on the ID, I can know what is the product name, what is the category, everything. Even more details could be there here related to the product, like the price, who is the supplier, all the details related to the product, we can put it here. So by having this information in separate tables, like a customer table, product table, and refer them in the transactions. This is what we call it as a relational database. Relational database means data is stored in multiple tables related to each other through a common key fields. Like here we have product ID, we call it as a key field because this is used to refer to the products, okay? Based on that ID, I can identify what is the product and what are the different properties of that product. So this is how any database uses data stored in multiple tables. This is another example I would say. Here, supposing we have the employees, okay? So this is the information, right side bottom, what we see is the information about the employees. Each employee has an employee code, employee ID. What is his name? What is his job? Department, salary, data, all the information is there. But one thing you can observe, department, instead of showing the department name, we are storing the department ID. Okay? So anytime you want to know what is his department name, we can look up based on this ID. We are going to search for the name, location, and all the details about the department in this table. So we say that these two tables are related to each other through a common field called department ID. Okay, this is what we call it as a relationship between the tables. This is the most important part when you're working with an SQL database, because unlike in Excel, here we are going to refer to multiple tables while analyzing the data. Okay. So when you are building a relation between two tables, it's important that one of the tables, it maintains a unique column. Your department ID is there. You can see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Each ID represents only one department. Okay, sales means it is identified by the 30. So wherever in the employee table, wherever you see the 30, you can understand that this person is working in the sales department. Similarly, if it is a 10 HRD, whoever has the department ID as a 10, it means that he is working in the HRD department. This is how, instead of storing the, his department name, location, and or any details about the department here itself, we are storing it in a separate table. So when you are having multiple tables like this, we call that system as a relational database management system relational database management system, okay? So what are the minimum expectations expected to 
say that a particular database is a relational database management system. So EF code has conceived these 13 rules and any database that follows these principles, we call it as a relational database management system. Okay. For example, the foundation rule. So it should be using its relational capabilities. So relational database means it has to use relational capabilities. That means tables should be related to each other. Okay, you should not put everything into a single table. You should have multiple tables related to each other. Similarly, rule of information. In any table, the data is stored with reference to a primary key. That means here, if you see, each row in this table is identified by a department ID. Similarly here, each row is identified by an employee ID. Like this, you can also conceive this data in this form. You have these different fields, employee ID, name, job, department ID, salary, date of joining, who is his boss and what is the commission he gets. Everything you can see, all these columns are related to the employee ID. If I say, for this particular employee ID, what is his name? Or when did he join? Or what is his salary? Anything I can answer based on the ID. That's why we call it as a primary key or a unique field. And this table is related to another table called department, where department ID is the primary key here because this information, name and location are related to the department ID. So when you join these two tables, or when you build a relation between these two tables here, this department ID is used, referred here in this table. So with reference to this ID, I can make out what is the name of the department is working on or what is the location. So this is how <coughs> we relate to multiple tables and relational database management should always have the data split into multiple tables and have relations between them. Similarly, these two tables are there where employee ID is the common field between two. Here, while we have the his job details in this table, here we have his address details. So these are the simple examples of how data is stored in a relational database management system. And it's not just one, two tables. A database management system means we'll have multiple tables like this. Like there is a transactional table consisting of the data transactions. And this has a product ID only, okay? Which product is sold? We just refer an ID in this transactional table. And the corresponding name, product name, or any of its properties, you get it from a separate table. Similarly, a customer, DIM customer is a customer master, stores the full information about the customer. And we relate it to the transaction table here, having a customer key field here, as well as a customer key. So based on this common field between the two, we can look up and get the information from the second table, okay? Are you clear about what is the relationship? What do you mean by relationship between tables? Or any questions? Okay, then why should we store the data? And why should we use SQL or why should we learn SQL? That's what let us understand before going into the actual working on SQL. Let's understand why data should be stored like this and what is the benefit, okay? When you are having a directly a file like an Excel file, when you can see the content there itself, why do I require an SQL? One first basic advantage is that as the data increases, more people will be working on that. So when simultaneously multiple people, people have to work on a data, it should be properly managed. So this SQL databases help us, multi-users can connect to the same database because data is stored 
in one system and multiple users through their computers can connect to that common database. In case of Excel, if supposing three, four people try to connect and edit a single file, it will not support. You'll have to wait for the other two. One by one only you can edit the file. But in case of a SQL database, multiple people can interact with that. Like in a shopping mall, you can see 10 to 15 counters doing the billing. Everybody can parallelly do the billing, save the data, or retrieve the data. Okay? And you can just read the data what is required for you. Supposing you want to do a billing on a particular product. Once a product is selected, immediately you can see the price, availability of that product, all the details on the screen. You need not open the total data, filter it by the product and see the details. So that's what we call it as a query directly. Directly querying means you can filter out. You can ask a data with a filter. You can say, I want to see the details of a particular product. I want to see the address of a particular customer. Or I want to see all the transactions done by a particular customer. Like this, I can write a question. I can question the database and get the result of only what I am required to see now. That's what we call it as a query. Okay, in the structured query language. Query means asking a question to the data so that you get only the information that you want. And for asking that, we need to have a, some common language that can be understood by the database. That's what we call it as a SQL. Okay, SQL is a language that a database can understand and return you what you are asking for. By storing the data in multiple tables in a SQL, we are ensuring that redundancy and inconsistency is removed. If you store the same thing at multiple places, different data might be there. Like I told you, when the address is there, supposing every transaction you are typing in the address, phone number, phone number may be slightly different. You By mistake, you may type in different. And tomorrow you want to analyze the same customer will be considered as if it is a different person. So to avoid such redundancy issues, we can ensure that the data is stored only once in the system. Like a customer master will store each customer and his address only once. And it can be referred while invoicing, while billing, or you want to see a report of how many times he has come to you, what are the products he's buying. Everything you can get it based on a customer. When customer information is stored once, and it has a multiple transaction rows, okay? And it's a better memory management. Again, when you're storing only once, you're going to occupy lesser space. Retrieving would be much faster. You can sort them. Like a region-wise, I want to list out all the customers, city-wise customers. So I can easily filter out, put them in a proper order and retrieve them easily. There is a concurrency control and transaction management. Concurrency control means, like supposing in Excel, I'm storing the transactional information at one page. Another page I'm using to, so, to store the balance, total amount payable by the customer. Okay, so whenever I have to update the first page, I need to even update the second other page is also dependent on that. So that is called a transaction management. When you have to manage or update multiple sheets or multiple tables to complete a transaction. So in Excel, we don't have any such control of ensuring that all the sheets are edited simultaneously. That means you might be updating the first page and the second page you may forget to update or because of some errors, you may not be able to save it in the second sheet. So there will be inconsistent data. While the detail page is showing all the transactions, it's possible that the summary shows only few because of errors. But in case of SQL, you can manage it in such a way that either the data is saved in both the places or it's not saved anywhere. That's called transaction management. 
like supposing in accounting, you will be creating one account and debiting another account. So in a database, you can have, you have a full control wherein a debit and credit, both are documented simultaneously, or if one of them fails, both are reverted back. It will not be saved in any of them. And access control, access control means you can manage what can be accessed by a particular person. Like you have an application which saves the transactions, which saves our billing, all the information. That person can only save data into the database. A report writer, he can only read the data. He cannot modify any data. That's what we call it as access control. And in Excel, supposing in the Excel, anybody can add a new column, start saving data, correct? But say it is an SQL server, you can ensure that a DBA, there are different roles, different people who will be using the same SQL. A DBA or a database administrator is going to create the tables. He will decide what will be the different columns. And in each column, what type of data will be stored? that will be fixed, okay? Like order date is there. He will say, you store only dates here. Amount is there. It will store only the numbers. Like that, a DBA is going to decide what will be stored in each of the columns. Next, an application developer is going to save the data into those columns as per the definition. So he can save only the dates into that order date amount, name of the customer, everything he can save only what is defined by the DBA. Extra report writer can only read the data. He cannot modify anything. He cannot make any changes to the data. That's how access control can be properly managed as per the requirements. So that data is accurate and consistent. And data size. That is a main advantage. There's no limit to the data size. You can have any number of rows and columns stored in a database. And since it is stored in a separate system called SQL Server, multiple people can access it from their individual systems and retrieve whatever they want, or they can save the rows. Multiple people can save the data into the database. It will always ensure that there is a proper meaningful data is stored. Like, for example, a new customer has come. First, you need to save the customer's name and reference address in the customer master. Then only you can save a transaction. So there cannot be any IDs without a proper customer information. That is called integrity constraint. Data is consistent and useful for us the, for the reporting. Multiple user interface, that means multiple people can parallelly work on the same database, save the data or read the data parallelly. It could be done by different systems. Like a report writer might be using this data to present it in a Power BI or an Excel reports. Application developer can use his applications, a .NET application, or a Java application can be used to save data. A DBA can directly connect to the server and see what is the data in the tables. So different people use different interfaces and see the data to the extent they need and they are authorized to see. There's no limit in the size of the data. You can go on adding any number of rows, any number of tables can be added or included even at the later stage. So as your requirements increase, as your applications add new functionalities, it is easy to update a database. So restricted access that we already discussed, there is a security feature where you can restrict what can be viewed by a database. So this is basically about the main database. First letter, the main thing we have to understand is that in a database, data will be stored in the form of multiple tables. A table is the primary object where we're going to store the data. In addition to tables, we also have other 
forms of objects like views, triggers, stored procedures. There are different ways. The basic purpose is to ensure that data is consistent. We are seeing the different advantages. We are ensuring that data is properly stored in the right way that can be relied upon and used. So our basic concentration of this course shall be to read the data from the databases, okay? So we are going to show how to save the data briefly, but main concentration, most of our course, we will be discussing about how to get data from multiple tables efficiently and view the data. So the data can be used in our further course. Like after this SQL server, we are going to learn about Power BI, which is a data visualization tool. Okay. In that all, we are going to see how to consume this data, how to say, take this data and present it in the way it is understood by the end users. A data like this, if you are having a data in the form of tables, so many columns, it may not be meaningful for the end user. He want to see for each category, what are my sales? For each product, which product is giving me highest profits? So to get it, you don't get all the information in a single table. You may have to combine data from multiple tables, put them all together, and give the result in the way the end user wants. That's where we are going to use SQL queries. A query is asking a question about the data. Okay. So as we have discussed, the data is stored in a server. It's called a client server environment. While Excel text files store the data in the file itself, and we are directly opening the file and reading the content. But in case of databases, we are going to store data at a central place called a SQL server. It could be there in your own same computer or most often in any office organization. The server will be a separate entity. It will be stored, it will be a separate computer. And we are going to install a client application in our local computer. That is a inter client application is basically an interface from where you can connect to the server and view the data. Okay. So the data in the server can be accessed by multiple people to view the data and understand what is there. As simple, we are going to understand this SQL using Microsoft SQL Server, okay? The SQL queries that we are going to write, they are almost common whether you are using a SQL Server or a Oracle or a MySQL or Postgre, IBM, any of them, all of them follow the same standard SQL, okay? So for our practical, learning the purpose, we are going to use Microsoft SQL Server. So this server to be installed in our computers, local computers. Since we are using as a standalone, we are going to install the SQL Server as well as a, as well as a client in our computers. So this requires around uh, 4 GB or ideally 8 GB of RAM in our computer and a Windows 10 or later version. So do you have that? Uh, computers. This is a free software given by Microsoft. We can download and install it in our computers. Okay. So we are going to see how to install the SQL Server client and then start writing the queries. We also have a sample database provided by Microsoft. We are also going to see how to use that. So before that, let me just demonstrate how SQL Server looks, how the data is stored. Because till now we have been just discussing about the theory. Let's have a look at the actual server and then we'll see how to install this. So basically to connect to a database, first thing we should have a server with a data created in that, database created in that. And next, we need to have a SQL Server client application. Here for Microsoft, it is called as Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. This is the application or the interface through which we connect to a server. So how to work with the SQL Server? 
just open this SQL Server Management Studio. I'm going to show you how to uh, download and which version to be installed. But before that, just I want to give you a feel of how the data is stored in the server. So SQL Server Management Studio is the client application we call it. That means every computer, even when you are working on a SQL Server in your office, you will be going to install only the SQL Server client. Server will be there separately, which will be connected to by multiple people. So this is the first window that we'll be seeing when you connect to the SQL Server client application, Microsoft SQL Server management studio. So it will ask you here, which server you want to connect to. In any office, there will be multiple servers. Like each client, you might be using a separate server or for a production. That means for the your live data, you will be having one server. For the testing team, you might have a separate server. For the development, separate server like this. Data can be existing in multiple servers. So you can here select which server you want to connect to because this is a client application can connect to any of the servers and get read the data. So supposing I want to connect to this particular server, I will select the server name and Windows authentication. Windows authentication means you are using the supposing uh, this computer is there. When I switch on the computer, I will be using my username password to connect. The same username password is used to even connect to the server. Okay. Another method is SQL Server Authentication. So primarily, let us say we use the Windows Authentication now. Click on Connect. So in the left side, in the object browser, we will be seeing the databases. You can expand these databases. It shows the different databases available in this particular computer server. A database is like a subfolder in the server. Each application will have its own database. So a server might have multiple databases. So always when you're working on a server, you should know on which database you want to connect to and work on. So let us say we expand this employee information table, employee EMP. This is one database. Okay. This is a server instance. We see what we have selected server that is called a server instance. That means the total server installed in a computer, we call it as the server instance. Within the server instance, we will have multiple databases. That database is basically a set of related tables stored at one place. Okay. Supposing you are working on an employee information, a HR team is there. All the HR tables might be stored in a database called EMP. It stores the employee's information. Okay. How it is stored within the database, data is stored in the form of tables. So click on this plus symbol to expand the tables. You will be seeing the different tables that are existing in this database. So this is how data is stored. First on a insta server, within the server in a database, in the database in the tables. Now I want to read the what is the data available here. So I'm going to write a query. I'm going to query the database to get a data. So click on this new query. This is just I'm demonstrating how the data is there. Later we'll be seeing how to create the database, how to create the tables and everything. Okay. So now I have these tables. Normally when it is an Excel sheet means we are going to see all the data in a sheet, but here I don't need to see open the table and see. Instead, I will write a SQL query in the form of SQL language to read that. So how we write it? It is as simple, just like an English statement. I want to select all the data from a table. Okay, see all the, like selecting a range in an Excel file. I can simply say, select to read the data from a table. I'm going to use the statement called select. Okay. A select is to read data from a set, from where? And what you want to read? 
I use a asterisk symbol to say all. Stra asterisk is a wild card. That means I want to see everything. Select star means select everything from where. So from, let us put it in caps for understanding. Select star from, table name is employee. So I'll say employee. Select star from employee. That means I want to read the content available in a table called employee. Click on execute. So it will show the total data available here. Okay, this is how data is stored in a table. It consists of header, column names, employee ID, employee name, job, department, each of them are the column. So here the main important thing we need to understand is that while creating the table itself, we are going to decide, tell, this table, employee table, how many columns will be there? Just like Excel, you cannot have 16,000 columns. We don't need to use. We have to define first what columns will be used in a table. Okay, here, for example, employee table, a DBA is going to define that this is the name of the table employee. It is going to have these below columns, employee ID, employee name, job, Department ID, salary, date of joining, boss, and commission. Within the bracket, you can see there is some additional information. It says employee ID, PK int not null. What does that mean? Employee ID is the name of the column, correct? PK, primary key. Primary key means this column is going to be unique always. This row of data is going to be identified by the employee ID. So all this information is identified based on an ID. So this ID has to be unique. If supposing two employees in your office have the same login ID. Nobody knows who is working on. Okay, like you may get other person's salary because employee ID is same. Everything will be working based on the employee ID. Same way you're also you can know the employee name, job, everything based on the employee ID. So this ID has to be unique. That means no two people should have the same ID. And also you can't leave it blank. There cannot be a person without an ID. Okay. So a record is identified by a field called a primary key. So every person or every row should have a data for this particular column. And also, no two people will have the same ID. That's what we call it as a primary key. It's an integer. Int means integer. It has to be a number. We are telling the DBA say that this column can have only an integer value. You cannot have an employee ID like 1.5432 like this based on the definition. And not null. Not null means you cannot leave it blank. When an employee's row is created, it should have an ID. That's how we define a column while creating the table itself. Employee name is there. It says n where care 100. That means it can have any number of characters up to 100 maximum. And also it cannot be left blank. Not null means it cannot be left blank. So to save a data about an employee, you should have at least a employee ID and a name. Without these two information, you cannot store. All other columns you can see here, a job is also a 50 character text maximum. But it is null. That means you can even create a row without a job. Job designation might be given later. But initially, you might be having a blank job title. Similarly, department ID, salary, date, a date for date of joining, a boss, that means who is your manager, a commission how much. Like this is the information you want to store for an employee. So the horizontal set of data represented by this a serial number and all the information, this we call it as a row or a record. A record stores the information 
related information and you can retrieve that related information using a key field okay each of them is a record or a row similarly vertically what we see they are called the columns or fields each of them are called the fields or the columns of this table the table name this is the table name okay this is how we understand a database first we are going to connect to the server using a our windows authentication or a username password then we, when we expand the server we see the different databases pick up the appropriate database which you want to work on and in that database data is stored in the form of tables okay a table consists of a name of the unique name within the table you see the data in the columns and the good thing about these columns is that you have predefined data types when i say date it can store only date if you try to enter anything else it will give an error and it will not save so only concurrent data will be available in a database okay so the simplest query here we are written select star from employee that means read all the data from a table by name employee this is going to show a header with the column names and the data completely available here here this is a simple example of having only eight columns but when you work on a database you might have a face a table having 50 60 columns also and you don't need to read everything okay you can say i want to see only the employee name his job and salary so i can list out the fields here what data i want to see so i can here say select e name comma job comma salary okay the table name is employee in this table i want to read only the name job and salary see it's not even case sensitive you can write the names in small letter or capital letter but you can list out what are the columns i want to see now okay and then click on execute so it will return only the columns you have selected so this is how you can limit the columns that you want to read from a database whatever you don't need to read the whole thing you can just read what are the columns required this is just like selecting the columns in an excel file excel file here yeah. i can click on this use a control key to select what all columns i want to read correct copy this and put it somewhere same way in sql server you are going to list out what are the columns you want to see and from which table and that is going to return similarly in excel we apply filters i can filter out and say i want to see only the records of a particular designation like say i want to see only the salesmen how many salesmen are there so that i can do it here using a where clause where is like a filter that we apply in the excel a where will restrict the rows that are going to be returned so here i can say where job is equal to say salesman so now we are just trying to convert this simple query select star from employee we are trying to control manage and see what we want to see only what is required so select e name job salary from employee so i want to see only these three columns where job is equal to salesman that means i want to apply a filter on the job column to see only the salesman so it will restrict and show only this much information okay so like this we can write different queries this say so supposing i want to see the highest paid on the top and least paid at the bottom so i can also write sorting sorting is done here using the order by clause order by say salary again click on execute so now it is sorting the salary from the lowest to the highest ascending is the 
default. Say I want to have highest salary on the top. I can put DESC, descending, sort them in the descending order. So it will show highest on the top, next the second, next like this. So this is how you can use the different clauses. We call each of them as a clause. Okay, you can observe. Here, say instead of, say employee, supposing I have written something else. Whatever is in the red color. Now you can see the red underline. When any error is there in the SQL query, it is going to show with a red underline to say that there is something wrong. You have to correct it. Okay. And also you can observe select from where order by. These are all in blue color. So any key field, we call them as the key fields. The key fields are the standard. Uh, reserved words, they are shown in blue color. List of columns are shown in black color. And anything you want to put it as a text, that is in red color, because it is, you want to filter the data based on that. Okay, based on this color coding also, we can understand the query. And uh, supposing I want to add some notes, comments, to understand what we are trying to get it from this SQL query. I can use a comment by putting two hyphen symbols, two hyphens, and then here I can write any text. Get data for salesman, something like this. I want to write it. It will be shown in green color. So always remember when you open a SQL query, what you see in green color, it is a comment. It will not have any impact on your output and it's not going to be executed. So only for our understanding, we can add comments as explanatory notes, which can be recorded at any time later or anybody else is seeing also, you can easily understand using the comments. Okay, so what we see in the green color is called the comment, blue color are the keywords and the other is in black color. The standard text is in black color. If there is any error, it will show in with a red underline. So it will be red underline means there is something wrong here. We need to correct. So these are the standard conventions are used for our easy understanding of the SQL query. Okay, is it clear? So this is a basic simple SQL query where we are trying to read a data about the names, the designation, and the salary of only salespeople. So here the advantage is that when you are having large data, you don't need to read everything. In Excel, opening the file itself is going to take a lot of time. But when it comes to a database, we are going to read only what is required for us. And we don't need to wait for the whole data to be loaded. Just read the data, what you want. And in fact, here, we are seeing the salary of the salesman. So supposing I remove this where clause. Okay, just for a minute, let me remove this. It is showing all the rows. Now I want to know designation wise, what is the salary being paid? For salesman, what is the total salary? For a developer's, what is the salary like that? I want to see. So I can write a query here, say select job, comma, sum of salary. Just like in Excel, how we use a sum function. Here also, I can use the sum function, sum of the salary from employee. So whenever I want to get a sum or a totals, I want to say first group the data. So group by I want to get salaries total by each job. So I want to group the data based on the job. And for each job, I want to get the total of salary. So I can write like this. Presently, I'm getting 19 rows of all the employees. But when I use this group by 
okay order by salary is not possible because we are doing a summation we are not getting the individual salaries so we can say order by sum of the salary so now it shows what is the total salary being paid to the managers what is the salary paid to the developers and like this so instead of returning 19 rows from the database now i can read only the seven rows that's how aggregations can be done at the back end itself so the you don't need to get all the data load all the data into your excel or in any report you can do the aggregations in the query itself just get the data what you want in the form you want and show it in the reports so these are the advantages of using a and learning sql because by understanding these how to write a queries we can get what is the data i want it from the database and use it in my reports i don't need to depend on it people or anybody else or a dps to write the queries and give me every time there is a requirement or there is a change we can do it ourselves because as a part of a report writer whether it's a data analyst or a uh mis analyst where you want to interact with the data you should understand how is the data stored in the systems how to retrieve it so that you can do an efficient job if you are depending on somebody else it person he may not be understanding what is the end requirement you have to tell them everything what you want so he will write a query and give it to you the data that may not be the most efficient way so if you are able to because you know the requirements if you are able to write the sql query you can do a better job that is the purpose we are just recommending that all the report writers to learn sql it's not necessary that always you will be working on sql only power bi may work on even excel or any other databases but if you have a sql knowledge it will be surely useful to be a better data analyst okay so this is a we understand about the importance of sql so to further work on this first we need to install sql server in our computers so you need to download the sql server from this path so i'm going to share this link for those who want to install it now so this sql you can learn only by practice okay so you have to set it up in your systems let me know if anybody has a difficulty like uh, if you don't have a, a system to install it Okay, please try to download from this path, and I can help you install it in your systems. And uh, for those who have joined late, please let me can tell let you know that we are going to use Microsoft SQL Server. and our idea is to learn sql querying okay a main importance shall be in learning how to write sql queries and read data from a database of course we will be discussing now how to install the server how to create a database how to add tables but main concentration shall be on reading data from the existing database how to utilize the different relationships existing get the right data we want from the database so that it can be used in the reporting okay 
So as a continuation after SQL, we are going to learn about the Power BI data visualization tool, wherein we are going to see how to source data from different databases, different uh, data sources, I can say, because it's not only SQL database, we are going to see even how to connect to an Excel, a flat file or a web pages and read data in a, present them as a visualizations in a Power BI report or a dashboard. So that's the main idea. Our main idea is to able to extract data from the SQL server and present it in a report. So for that, we are going to understand first how to work with the SQL. Okay, so the SQL is a standard language and it's almost same whether you're working on Oracle, MySQL or SQL server. But since we have got a very good server, software easily accessible for by given by the Microsoft, we prefer to use a SQL server, okay? So I've shared a link. You can click on that and you will be seeing this screen. Here you can download and install SQL server in your systems. So we are also going to share you a few documents on the steps, how to install it. The, let me tell you uh, briefly about the course, how it's going to continue. So this is basically a weekend batch, wherein every week, Saturday and Sunday, we are going to conduct this course on Saturday and Sunday mornings between 10 to 1. And we'll be starting from now. Today, we are seeing how to install the software in our systems. And next, we are going to see how to create a database, how to restore a sample databases, how to add it, create a new database or add an existing database, how to set it up in our computer, how to add tables, delete different commands available in database we'll be seeing. And also we are going to see how to query the data, what are the different ways, different functions like how to join data from multiple tables and put them all together in a single output, how to use types of joins like left join, right join, full join, and uh, how to use a union function, exist function, like the different inbuilt functions are available, how we do, use functions in Excel, some average, max, minimum, same way here even SQL also has many functions. We are going to use a discuss on different functions that will be used, okay? So we'll do one thing, we'll take a short break here. Meanwhile, you can download this using this path. You can scroll down, you can see here, developer edition, this you need to download, okay, developer edition. Because this is a fully featured free edition. You can just install in your computer and use it unlimited time. There's no trial period or anything. It can be used continuously for any length of time. So we need to install this developer edition. Okay, only developer edition only take. This is one uh, download required now. And another one is, you can scroll down to the page, you see here, SQL Server Management Studio. This is the client application. As I told you before, one is the server. The developer edition is the server. This we are installing it in your local systems only for the sake of learning, okay? Otherwise, when you're working in office, it will be separately available, managed by a DBS. What we'll be requiring in our local computer is this SQL Server Management Studio. This is the one which we'll be installing in the local computers, which will be available even when you're working anywhere. Through this, you're going to connect to the server. So try to download both of them. We'll come back in 10 minutes and then we'll continue with the installation. And then we're going to see 
other features? What are the types of commands we need to give? What is the purpose of that each command and how to do that? That will be continuing, okay? So let's take a short break and also make sure to download these two things in this break time. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise you can take a refresh yourself and come back in 10 minutes to continue.
Okay, welcome back. So till now we have understood the importance of SQL and uh, benefits of SQL over the standard Excel or any flat files. Okay, is it clear or any questions? Do you feel it's useful to learn SQL or you have any doubts, please let me know. Uh, any of you, have you tried downloading the server? Okay, so anyway, we'll be So I'll be showing now the steps, basic steps on that. You can try to follow now, or you can do it even after the session, that's fine. So for any explanation, we are going to share you the queries that we use it or the explanation, like a SQL server setup is there. Okay, this document may be created for 2017, but now 2019 is there. You can work on that, use that 19, okay? So we are going to make sure this is very important that you download only the developer edition. Okay, select the developer edition and click on download. It is going to download an exe file, SQL Server 2019-ssei.dev. Okay, and when you click on that, select the basic version. We need only the SQL part. So select only basic because if you load too many uh, features, it will impact your system performance. So what's necessary only we have to install and later if required, you can add other features. So select the basic version, you can click on the accept button because there will be one uh, option to select and accept the terms and conditions that is necessary. So you have to click on that accept and continue with all the default, just click on next, next and install it. Okay, this is how SQL Server can be easily installed on your system. So you can even try it out now if anybody wants. And then after installation, you have a few features to be set up. They are listed out here. You can click on this SQL Server Configuration Manager. Ensure that they are enabled. TCP IP and networking should be enabled for the client, okay? Make sure that these are enabled. So, and one more feature available with this SQL server is that either you can continuously run the server, that means it is a service running at the back end, or you can just stop it and use it only when you are using the SQL server, you can switch it on. Okay, that we will see after installing the SQL server management studio, a client application. Okay, to install the SQL server management studio, you are going to scroll down and click on this one, SQL Server Management Studio. This is a very easy to install. Like this is the main benefit of the Microsoft products. You don't, uh, installation doesn't require any specific expertise or any IT person is not required. You can install it yourself. Just click on that, the file will be downloaded. Click on that exe, it will show the path where it is going to install. If you want, you can change the path, otherwise leave it as it is. Click on next and say install. SQL Server Management Studio also will be installed. Okay, so we can install both of them. If you find any issues or any difficulty in installing, you please contact me. I'll be able to help you out, okay? The client setup basically install, I require this file. Okay, you will be selecting this, download SQL Server Management Studio and click on that. It will be installing it in your system. Now, one more thing is there to work on the database. We require one sample database. While when we create a sample database, it may be a very small size, but to have a fully featured, a real-time database you want, we have a 
sample database called adventure works which is a having all the tables that are expected in a real time data so you can install that sample database also that is available you can search on uh, let me show if the path is available here I will give you the path for the sample database. Okay, this is the path for the sample database that is shared in the chat window. You can download that. You can open the window. Here you can see adventure was dw2019.bak. This is the one we'll be using in our training sessions. So please try to download this. I'll show you how to restore it. Just download it and keep it ready. Well, we need to have a server. A, a server and then a client SQL Server Management Studio and then this sample database. These three should be ready. You try to set them up. If you are not able to do it, no problem. We are going to do tomorrow. We are going to see how to restore the database. Okay. Before that, let us understand why there are so many data types. What is OLTP database and what is the data warehouse? Anybody having an idea? What is OLTP? And what is a OLAP? When we're talking about the database, okay, database means a set of tables related to each other stored in a server. Okay, that we understood. Now, what is the difference between OLTP and OLAP database? Any person having idea? So we discussed that a database is used by multiple people, different people based on their expertise and their role in the office. A DBAs are going to use the database to set up a database, basically a database creation, installing a server and creating a database is done by the DBAs. They are going to create the database, add tables to the database. Adding tables to the database, we call it as a data definition, creating a tables, okay? Once the tables are created, next application developers are going to add data to, through the applications, data will be inserted into the tables. And uh, so the main purpose of creating the first database is to help the application team save data into the database. So the tables are always created in such a way that it is optimized for saving the new transactions, new rows. That means like supposing you are doing a sales, only one invoice is saved at a time by a user, okay? After saving one invoice, then you will go to the next invoice. So the table should be designed in such a way that you can, it is very efficient for the saving the transactions, one transaction at a time into the tables. And even they want to print, they are going to print one invoice, one by one, the invoices will be printed. So the data this design should be in such a way that it is optimized for transactional saving. That's what we call it as an online transactional processing database, okay, or OLTP database. OLTP database is designed, the tables are number of tables. They are designed in such a way that the data can be easily saved into the system. And once the data is saved into the system, we are going to, a report writer is going to access the data to create the reports. While creating the reports, very often we are going to access multiple transactions because we would like to see what are the total sales in a month. 
how to verify the sales across different months of an year or what are the total sales from a particular region. So there will be basically a need to access multiple rows. Hundreds of thousands of rows have to be accessed and we might be doing some aggregations. So the table structure required for reporting would be slightly different. To have an optimum performance, good performance, the table, the way data is stored for reporting would be slightly different compared to the saving the transactions. So very often big companies, what they do is they will have two sets of databases. One set is designed for the transactional processing to save the transactions. Next, daily, periodically, at, at the end of the day or at a certain time, they are going to transform this data, convert that data and store it into another database, having a different set of tables. The table design would be different. That reporting, the database created for the reporting will have fewer tables, lesser tables. So that retrieving a multiple rows, the main idea of the reporting database is ease of retrieval. Data should be easily retrievable. For a many rows, for hundreds of rows, you must be able to easily retrieve. So this is a, a good practice in most of the companies. Two databases will be there. Both will have the same content but the number of tables and how it is stored would be different. OLTP stands for Online Transactional Processing, which is the design, table design for application development and saving the rows by invoices and all the day-to-day -day transactions. Other one is OLAP, Online Analytical Processing Database. This is the database designed for ease of retrieval where you want to analyze the data, retrieving multiple, many number of rows at a, at a time. So most of the time we'll be working on OLAP databases, but we need to understand these two are both are SQL databases only. Only the design of the tables is different. Both are going to store the same content, but in a different format. Like, as I said, the OLTP databases, online transactional processing is used for day-to-day -day modification. That means you are going to insert a few rows. You might update. Update means change the content of the data or delete some of the data. Supposing a, some wrong transaction happened, it has to be deleted. They may delete the data. So the, so the database is designed, optimized for to see that the insert, update, and delete takes place easily, that you're going to easily change the data, retrieve a data, particular transactions. But when it comes to OLAP, it is designed for online data retrieval and data analysis. So extracting large data that will help in decision making. That is the purpose of the OLAP database. OLTP database, this is the actual original database that is saved by the transactions. While OLAP database is created based on the OLTP database. Already OLTP database is created by the transactions. You're going to convert that and store the data in a different format. So this is done by a process, background process. So transaction level, if you see, there will be short transactions, probably one invoice consisting of five to 10 products could be a saved in a OLTP, but in OLAP, you're going to retrieve many rows, multiple rows. So processing time for of a transaction is comparatively less in OLTP because when you are saving just one invoice or printing an invoice, it will not take much time. But for OLAP, it might take longer time because of the size and volume. And queries will be simple here in OLTP. In OLAP, it will be complex queries because you're going to combine multiple tables. You might be using aggregations like sum, average, or grouping by different fields. 
tables in OLTP are fully normalized. That means you're going to break up into as many tables as possible in OLTP. You just ensure that there is no redundancy. There is no duplication of data. Okay, if you, you are going to store in more number of tables in OLTP. In OLAP, they need not be fully normalized because you are not going to directly edit any data in the OLAP. It is all coming from the OLTP, but storing it in a different format. So even if there is a redundancy also, there is no problem. Our idea here is to ease of retrieval. Like if we go back to our earlier example of the Excel file, you have said that the customer names might repeat sometimes. If I use everything in a single table, storing the same name multiple times, it may cause errors, okay? But here advantage is that this data is not directly documented in an OLAP. So in OLAP, online analytical processing, even if the con there is a redundancy, there's a, the same content is stored multiple times also, there will not be any problem because nobody is editing these rows. It is coming from a, through a batch processing, through a, a SQL queries. So OLAP need not be fully normalized. That's what we need to remember. But OLTP is always a normalized data. There will be many constraints data will be stored based on the restrictions that we put in. So we are now going to discuss what are the restrictions, how do we design the table, what are the different constraints that we need to implement. All these things are required only for a OLTP. OLAP means because nobody is going to directly access any rows here, there's no impact. This, this OLAP database is created based on an existing OLTP database. So, number of restrictions will be less and it will be easier to work on this for the reporting purpose. But for transaction saving, always we go for a OLTP database. Okay, so these two we need to understand. Both are the SQL databases only. There's no difference in that. Both have the tables, data is stored in the tables. But how the database is designed, how many tables are required, how many relationships will be there, that will be different in both of them. Okay. So this is again, and why I'm telling you about this is because this is very important from the interview point of view. But to understand when you are given two databases, OLTP and OLAP, which database you should be using for reporting. So here we have this one, AdventureWorks2019.bak. This is a transactional database, OLTP database. This is a data warehouse, data warehouse or OL. AP, OLAP database. This is the one we are going to use for reporting purpose. Okay. Both will give a same output in the report, but this will be more efficient for reporting and this will be more efficient for day-to-day -day transactions. That's what we need to understand. So using this link, you can download this. We are going to see later how to use that to create a database and use it for query. Okay. So this is how we have seen how to install the server, how to install the client. And we, once you download the database, I can help you. If anybody has completed, I can show you now also how to install the database. Otherwise, you can complete it today and tomorrow we can see. Okay. This is all about the preparing for the SQL, learning for the SQL. So we have learned how to, what is the importance of SQL and how to set up the system environment for working on a SQL. Now, is there anybody who has a problem like who don't have the system resource to set up the SQL? If you want to learn SQL querying, but still you are not having a latest system to work on it. Still for them, there is an alternative, okay? There is an online simulator called W3School. This is only an alternative, but ideally, if you are able to set it up in your computer, that would be best. But if you are not able to do that, then you can even start writing queries online using this link. 
okay this is going to use mysql so the some of the queries could be different so we don't recommend this but if you don't have any other choice then you can practice the sql queries even in this it has a online simulator so here you can just write an sql query and see how it works say select star from computer customers this is this type of query we have seen correct so try it yourself click on that so you can write a query here select star from computer customers click on run sql online it will run here and show you the result okay we got all the data in this as supposing i want to restrict to the columns i can say here select i can type in here on the window itself comma address from customers and run the query so i'll be getting only the data where address like say supposing ob You can filter out like this. You can write the queries, but only the here issue is that we need to use these tables, existing tables. Right side, you see the table names. This is the database given by the W3 school itself. Using these tables, you can write different queries. You can learn the different concepts. What we discuss in the class, okay? Those queries, similar queries, you can write it here also and learn it. But this is only an alternative where you don't have a SQL Server. But ideally, if you are able to install SQL Server in your computer, that is the most recommended. That way you can practice exactly what we discussed in the classroom. Okay. And also we'll be giving assignments that can be done easily if you are having a SQL Server in your system. So try to install them today. Okay. So till now we have been discussing in general about the SQL. It is not specific to whatever we discussed till now. There is nothing specific to Microsoft SQL Server for any SQL. That means any of the RDMS that follows the rules set up by EF code. That means Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Sybase, Postgres, IBM, Teradata, all of them can be used for working on SQL. The SQL structured query language is common for each of them. But of course, everybody want to add some new flavors to that. They want to add some additional built-in functions, additional things they want to add it. So every SQL database adds some additional functionality. So the SQL, the common thing that is there, we have the SQL, okay? That SQL with a small flavor suitable for Microsoft SQL Server, it is called TSQL, Transact SQL. Okay, so we can discuss all these things with learning what is Transact SQL. Transact SQL is the, or TSQL is the customized SQL for Microsoft SQL Server. Similarly, for Oracle, what do you call it? Anybody have an idea? Queries we write in Oracle. So what is the language customized for Oracle? It's called PLSQL. PLSQL means procedural language SQL. That is the SQL customized or some flavors added suitable for Oracle. For Microsoft SQL, we call it as a TSQL or a Transact SQL. So Transact SQL is the language used to communicate to the server from the SQL client. Okay. Let's have understand some concepts of Transact SQL. Basically, TSQL or Transact SQL is the 
version of SQL, which has some extensions built on top of the SQL. These are suitable for Microsoft SQL Server. Okay, it was originally developed for Sybase, but now it has become part of the Microsoft. So Microsoft SQL Server uses TSQL as the procedural language for interacting with the server. So it is a, like a simple English like as we have seen. It adds some additional features, additional functions to be able to work on the database. And the basic steps, what are the things we need to do, we'll be doing on a SQL server or basically classified into few features like First thing is creating the database. Okay, creating. Let me show the proper slide. Okay, yeah, so here it is. So basically when you are writing a commands or the SQL statements, using TSQL. So these are the different types of commands we'll be using. They're called DDL or data definition language. It's a subset of the SQL, okay? DDL data definition language. DML is the data manipulation language. DQL is the data query language. DCL data control language. And TCL is a transaction control language. So these are the different types of subset of the commands we write what is first one is ddl ddl means defining the database that means creating a database adding tables to that changing the table content or dropping the tables so these are the called the ddl so we can say in the ddl basically we can say we have create create statement to create any object. Object could be a table, could be a view, could be a database, anything. We are going to use create. Okay, after creating, sometimes we may want to change this, modify that table, like adding a new column or changing the data type. So initially we have created a data type. So like integer, but later we want to make it something else text. So we are going to change this in the create statement. After creating, we are going to use alter. Alter is to change an existing table. Existing object, you want to make a changes. We are going to use alter. And sometimes we may want to remove a table, complete table, whatever is created has to be removed. Then we use the drop function. So these are the three data definition languages, create, alter, and drop. Create a new object, modify an object that is alter, or drop a table, drop a database. These are called the data definition languages. This is mostly done by the DBAs. Next, data manipulation, as the name says, manipulation means basically adding new data, modifying an existing data, or removing a data. So this is nothing to do with the tables. Within the table, in an existing table, supposing you want to insert a new data. Insert is adding new rows, okay? Or update the data. Update means modifying the data or delete. So these three are the activities of a data manipulation language. Who will do this? DML commands, who will be passing on DML commands? We have seen that first DDL is mostly done by the 
DBAs who create the database. Okay. Next, DML is for adding data to the database tables. That is inserting is adding new rows. Update is modifying the existing content or delete is removing that content. This is called the data manipulation language. Who are going to do this? Okay, generally it is done by the application developers. Application users, say not developers, I would say application users. Like when you're selling a product, the salesman, the biller, is going to scan the products and the create an invoice. So that is an application user. When he creates an invoice and saves it, that data gets automatically inserted into the database. Supposing you return a product, he has to remove that. So that is also an update. And at times you may want to delete the, some content, remove the content, that is called the deletion. Administrators are going to only create the table, an empty structure, give a template to, a, to the application people to add the data, okay? Database administrator's job is to create a template, create a new table saying it will have these columns and it is going to save the data into these columns. Actual data saving is done by the application users, okay? Those who use the application, they are going to save an invoice or enter a voucher, enter some production details. So end users are going to add data into the database. And that adding data or modifying the data, we call it as a data manipulation language. Next, data query language. Data query is reading the data. We are reading. Data query language is not going to change the content of the data anytime only the same data, it will be retrieved. You might retrieve for one transaction or for a period or for a particular category, particular region, particular customer like that. Using the different select statements, we are going to read the data. This is where data query language is used to read the content that basically consists of the select statements. Okay, select star from a table name, or select particular column names, use the where condition, group by conditions to filter out. All these things is done in the data query language, we call it. Next, data control language. Control language means who should be allowed to read the data? Who should be allowed to insert the data? Like in say delete, we see many places an invoice can be created, but if you want to delete any row, requires special permissions. Only authorized person can delete a data. So that is managed by the control language, DCL. DCL will grant or revoke the permissions to the end users. Grant means giving permissions. A revoke is removing permissions. These are the commands given to control what can be done by a person, what cannot be done by a person. Okay, this is called data control language, which consists of granting a permission or revoking permission. I can say grant select on a particular table to a person. Like supposing here we are Navya, so I can say that Navya has the permission to only read data. So it'll say grant select on these tables to Navya. So can only select the data, grant on insert, means can they can add insert data. Like this, we can grant or revoke the permissions for each of the users. Okay, similarly, we have the transaction control language. Transaction control language means, supposing you are uh, uh, transaction, particularly for the saving the any of the content. 
you want to save in multiple tables. I want to save the invoice information header in one table, name of the customer, his address, contact details, what is the invoice total amount that I'll store in one table and the individual, how many products he has purchased that I may store in another table. As we have seen here in the W3 details, there is one table for order header and another for order detail. Okay. Order header is there, order detail is there. And in the order detail, you are going to store multiple rows matching with one row in the header. We'll see that in our database also. Okay, this transaction control is useful where when you are storing the customer name and address, you are expected to store some products also in the second table. So data is meaningful when you store in both the tables at a time. Okay, order header is there, having the customer name and address and amount. Along with that, there should be a detail table storing the actual product details that are ordered. Anytime when there are no details or there is an error in saving the details, even header need not be stored. That's what we call it as a transaction control to maintain consistency in the data. When two tables have to be saved together or do not save in any of them. Like a main price you are saving in one table and taxes in another table. So either save it in both or do not save anywhere. That's what we call it as a transaction control. And that is managed using that TCL commands. Like begin trans commit. Commit is to save what you want to do. Or roll back. Roll back means revert that. Like supposing after begin trans, one table data has been saved. Next in the second table while saving, there is some error it is not able to save. Then it will roll back and remove the first table data also. Or in the other common scenario where data is saved in the first table as well as second table also successfully saved. Then it will commit. That means save both the tables together. That is commit. Commit when it is a successful and everything is going on fine. If any issue comes, then it is going to roll back so that it's not saved anywhere for that particular transaction. So this is managed using the TCL commands called begin trans, commit and rollback trans. So these are the different types of commands or the SQL language you are going to use to queue these all commands. First one is the create, alter, drop. They are related to the data schema or the columns, data types, relationships, such things. Next is DML, that is inserting, adding data is all with the only data, not with the columns. Not It is not going to change the number of columns or uh, column types will not be changed. Only existing table, you're going to add new rows. Insert, update, delete. Insert is to add rows. Update is to edit existing data. Delete is to remove a data. Next, DQL data query language is to read the data. It is not going to make any changes to original data. It is going to only read it, present it in a reports or invoice or any transaction. Output wherever you want, you can just read the data. Next, data control language is to ensure that the data is secure. Unauthorized people cannot edit the data or change the scheme. So grant and revoke will manage, will ensure the security of the data and it will manage in such a way that only authorized people can edit it. Next TCL transaction control language is used to maintain consistency of the concurrency of the data. Begin trans, commit trans and roll back. Okay, these are the different types of commands that will be given and we are using TSQL language to give these commands. So these are the important things that we need to learn. And next, constraints. When you are creating a table, you are going to ensure and limit what can be entered. Constraint is setting up a rules, like a non-null constraint. 
when you have a not null constraint, that means your EMP ID is there, it is not null. When you're giving a not null constraint, it means that a row saved into this table using an insert statement, it will not allow you to save a row without an employee ID. So any table, any data available in this employee table, every row will have an employee ID. You cannot have an information without an employee ID. That's called a not null constraint. Similarly, you can also save that when I'm entering a department ID, this department ID should be already existing in the department table. Okay, so I can enter only a data only when a department is there, then only I can use it. Without a department, I cannot have a department ID because here yeah, we have seen in this example, when you want to refer a department here, ID I want to give it, that should be already existing in this table. Then only it makes sense. I can use this link and get the information. Supposing here I somewhere I enter a number 70 or 80, there is no matching row here in the department table, then you can't get the information that is not useful. So this foreign key relationship, primary key will ensure that you have a unique rows, unique IDs, not null IDs. And foreign key will ensure that the ID referred here is a valid value. It is already there in the master. Similarly, you can have a check constraint saying that the salary column Salary is not above 5 lakhs. Like this, you can put a restriction, not less than 1,000, not less than 10,000. So that is called a check constraint. So like this, you can have some constraints. This will validate the data before getting saved into a table. Okay, it will ensure that the whatever data is saved is a valid value. Another one is called unique. Unique means supposing employee names are there. No two people should have the exactly same name. There's a rule we can set it. So that even if two people have the same name, it will be documented with an expanded surname or something. They will ensure that the employee name is unique. So like this different constraints can be set up. You can set up a default. Like supposing date of joining is there. If you want to enter a date of joining and supposing date of joining is not entered, what should I store here? I can store the current date, today's date as the date of joining. Like that, I can put a constraint that is called a default constraint. So these are the different things we can set it up while, des while designing the database so that data entered is almost valid, always valid. Not null constraint means it will ensure that the column cannot have a null value. So when you are saving a row, it will save only with the value here. Example is employee ID or a department ID where you're creating a department table. So not null constraint. Default constraint means if a user doesn't provide a value, you want to save it. Like best example is an invoice. When you're saving an invoice, at what time it has been saved? that user need not enter the date and time at what time is billing. It can automatically pick up from the system and show the current time. That's called a default constraint. When you set a particular column, invoice date as a default value equal to the current date, it will automatically save the current date and time without user entering any number. That is a default constraint. Unique constraint. Unique constraint is to make sure that the column has a Unique value, existing values are not allowed to be again entered. Each value will be different. Okay, the basic difference between not null and unique is, not null means it cannot be left blank. It can be even duplicated. Unique value means it has to be different or you can leave it blank. If you are entering something, it has to be different. Not null means you can't leave anything. There's no choice. You have to enter something. And you have a combination of two, not null and unique. That becomes a primary key. That means a primary key. You cannot leave it blank. 
you have to enter something and also it should be unique it should not be a duplicate value a foreign key means referring to one column in another table like we have seen here in the department this id is referred here so whenever you are entering any number here it has to be already existing in this table that's called a foreign key relationship check constraint is to see that the value is valid like you are entering the date of joining you can say that it has to be always in the current month or only the past date only a person cannot join in the future date so date of joining always you give as a current or a past date only or a salary is there you can say it should be between 10000 to 5 lakhs like this you can put a constraint a restriction on the value that can be documented index is another constraint where index is going to store the data in a proper order this is also useful for retrieving the data much faster you can say you can maintain a index of the dates so it will store the employee ids in the order of the date of joining so that any time you can easily retrieve who has joined before a certain date or after a certain date so that's what we call it as the index index is a secondary table that stores the data in a specific order other than the standard one so it can store the data employees in the order of the date of joining or employees in the order of their salary like that it will store in secondary tables which will be useful for speedy retrieval of the data okay so these are the different ways these are the different conditions we need to understand when you are creating a table so so many restrictions can be put the main purpose of putting all these restrictions is to ensure that our data is not having any errors it is consistent and concurrent so that we can easily use it for our reporting purpose or to have a consistency that will be always useful like supposing in a excel now you are working on a taking an output you are grouping the data and the date column has some invalid dates then you are not going to get the right report but in a database always data will be consistent because it is following so many rules it is ensuring that only valid data is available in the tables so whatever report we take out from that will be a valid report okay so this is a current sheet we are seeing the comparison between an excel and sql in a excel we are going to open a excel file and each sheet we can say it is equal into one table okay one table we see it in the database it can be considered as same like a sheet in a excel file when you are selecting a range of data in a sheet it can be similar to select start from or select particular columns from again here you can see the advantage is in excel you have to see all the columns but in a database you can select specific columns in excel we apply a filter by selecting a particular column we can apply a filter here say i want to see only the particular class first class people only customers only will be same thing we do it in a sql by using a where clause where ship mode is equal to first class it will filter out and show it similarly you want to sort the data here select the column and click on data sort a to z or z to a same thing here we do it using a order by clause order by will sort the data where clause will filter the data and group by will aggregate the data you want to have a sum of average salary you can say average so it will return the average of the salary like this we can use aggregate values with the help of group by function
Okay, pivot table is used in Excel that is similar to group by in SQL. Similarly, we use a VLOOKUP to get data from different sheets into our different tables into a particular column. Same thing we use here in Excel joins. A join means, supposing here, let me show an example of a join. We have seen, we can write select, select is to read the data, okay? Star from employee, it gives the complete data from the, this is selecting a complete sheet. So let us assume in Excel, this is like selecting a complete sheet. Now, if I want to restrict the data, I can use a list of columns I can provide here. Say, I can say e name, comma job, comma DEPT ID. I'm getting a DEPT ID here. I don't have a department name. So DEPT ID from employee. Okay, when I execute this, I will get the department employee name, job and department ID. But I want to know what is the department name. IDs are not meaningful for the end user. I want to get the name. In such case, we are going to say, this employee table, I want to look up. Look up is done using a function called join. Join DEPT. I want to join these two. What is the lookup column here? On in employee table dot DEPT ID. That means there is a column called DEPT ID in the employee table. This I want to see the, for the same ID, I want to get the name from the department table. Correct? Where is the slide? Yeah. Yeah. I want to select this department ID and I want to see for the same ID for this 10 ID, what is the row in the department table? So I have to say, join these two tables on employee tables department ID should be equal to the department ID in the department table. So for the matching row, I want to get the information. So I'm going to use this join on employee.department ID is equal to DPT dot DPT ID. So this way I can get the matching columns from this one. So instead of not department ID, here I can use the D name, which is the name from the second table. While employee name and job are coming from the employee table, D name is coming from the department table. Even location, I can get any number of columns from the second table. It will show only the matching row. For this manager, what is the ID? So here I see each employee name and job from the first table and his department name and the location from the second table. This is how we use the join condition to get data from two tables, two or more tables. Where in Excel, we write a VLOOKUP only to get data from one column in the second table. One for each column, I have to write a VLOOKUP. But here, by providing a join condition, I can get data from any number of columns from the second table. Okay, so this is how we can compare the Excel with the SQL. Filters, sort by pivot tables or aggregates, lookup. Lookup is, in fact, joins are much more advanced compared to the lookup. Because lookup will, uh, joins will even take care of rows where there is no matching data. It will not give any error if there is no error, there is no matching row. Okay, like for example, here in the employee table, EMP is not defined for a particular person. Still, you can get the data here. Say here, I want to see the data even though employee Department is not assigned. Still, I want to see the person. So I can see this shake. He's not, uh, there's no department name and location because it's not yet allocated. Still, I want to see this information. I can get it. Okay, this facility is not there in Excel. 
there, we have to use the if error. Probably we need to use the if error and say, if there's no matching, you show something else. But here directly I can use joins to get the data, whether a person has a department or not. Okay, this is how we can combine data from multiple tables and show it in a single one, okay? So the main purpose of doing all this combining is when you use it for a report, for an output, I can just use this directly. Okay, I can write a query like this and use it in my reports. I don't need to get data from multiple tables, write a lookup formula, all those things. Directly, I can write an SQL query like this, combining data from multiple tables and present it in a report. Okay. So this is how we can write SQL queries. Just for, for you to get a feel of SQL, I've just shown you how to write the query. But we are going to see how to add a database, how to add a table. That means creating a table, how to insert data into the table, and then query the data. All the steps will be seen. That means all the commands. All these commands and how to put restrictions. We'll be seeing step by step in the coming classes. Okay. But for now, just understand how SQL query is useful. It's beneficial and easier to work with. Because you have seen the commands. There's this like simple. English command only, select is reading the data. Where is to filter the data. Join is to combine the tables. So like a simple English, but we have to use these standard keywords to read data from a database. Okay, is it clear or any questions? So after learning this SQL, the next important thing that we need to learn is to present this data. Either we can import this SQL query data into an Excel file, or we can also use it in a different reporting tools like Power BI, Tableau, or if you are an application developer, or if you are using a Python also, there also you can write this SQL queries to extract the data and present it in the way you want. Let me show you how to use this simple query within the Excel file to read this data, okay? So we'll copy this query. Yes, yeah, surely, we look up and joins, I'll explain, yeah. We are going, joins is the most important part of this SQL queries actually. So here, Let us see here, these are the two tables available, okay? This is the employee data and this is the department data, okay? So let me say, I have this information available in an Excel file. Let me see if I have it, Excel. I think here it is there. Okay, I have these tables. Here, okay, you know Excel, now we look up, you know. Let us say here, based on this department ID, I want to get the department name here. So we are going to write a VLOOKUP formula. This will be is equal to VLOOKUP. Look up for the, this department, 10 number in this table in this range, okay? Look up value is this one. This we want to look up in this range and then get the data from the second column. Column index two means 
in this range, second column information, I want to get it with a exact match. So this is how we write a lookup formula here. So we get the name HRD for this department ID. HRD is the name of the department. Same thing when I copy this across to the other rows, I get the department of each of the persons. If it is a null, there is no matching null here. So I'm getting a NA error. For that, I may have to use a if error. In this VLOOKUP formula, show it as say NA or something. Otherwise, you will be getting an error. So here NA we are getting, or you can say null, something we have to show it here. Okay. Let us say instead of NA, we'll put it as null. So wherever there is a matching for each of the department IDs, if there is a corresponding row, we'll get the information here. Otherwise, we'll get a null. Now say, supposing I want to do it for location. Again, I have to write a formula here is equal to we look up, look up for this ID. In this range and get the data from the third column with an exact match. So this will give the location from where, where is that particular department located? Okay, again, this null can handle it. This is how we do it in the Excel. In case of SQL Server, what we can do is we'll define, say that department ID, this is same as the department ID here. Department ID of the employee table is same as the department ID in the department. Both are storing the same information. So using this value, pick up the correspond data from this second table. So how we are going to write this SQL query up to here, I think this is clear. Select employee name, job. I can write the query in multiple lines also. It has no difference. Only for clarity, I'm putting in separate lines, okay? Select employee name job from employee, join DEPT. This is how we are going to tell that both have a related column. Employee join DEPT on. On means what is a common field between the two? On. Employee dot DEPT ID. That means in employee, there is a column called DEPT ID that is storing the same data as a DEPT dot DEPT ID. That means there is a similar column in department table. Based on this condition, this value in department ID is same as the department ID in department. Based on this condition, get the data from the corresponding row in the department table. This is what we are saying. So once this is available here, I can refer to the columns in department table as well as employee table. Like I can say employee dot DEPT ID. So this is the ID available in the employee table. For this, I want to get the D name, common location from the department table. So like this, I can list out all the columns from the second table. So any number of columns from the first table and second table can be added together into a single output. Based on this common value, it is going to pick up. Okay, so here you can see in Excel, what is the information you got? Same thing you're getting here also. Okay, you can see HRD Hyderabad, Accounts Hyderabad, Accounts Hyderabad, same thing we got it here also. Instead of writing VLOOKUP, here we are just using a join condition. So you get the data from the second table also. Is it clear?
So we are going to see many examples of this type where you, you are joining not only two, even three, four tables can be joined to get the data from multiple tables into a single output. Okay. So this output can be used. Like say, supposing I have an Excel file, I want to get this data into an Excel easily. It's not necessary that every time I write it here, copy this and paste it there. In the Excel itself, we have an option wherein we can import data from a database and show the output here. If you are having Excel 2016 or later versions, you have got this option in the data, get data from database from SQL Server. Like this, different databases can be connected directly from the Excel. I think it is disabled here. Let me show it in the Power BI. Power BI is the tool that we are going to learn after this. So to launch Power BI is a data visualization tool. That means that is where we are going to consume data from different data sources and present it in the form of different visuals. So Power BI. So this is also a Microsoft product. So, and in the Power BI, there's no restriction that you have to get data only from the SQL server. You can get data from any of the data sources. It could be an Excel file, text file, Microsoft SQL server, or Oracle, or IBM, or any of the data sources, or from a web page also. You can read data. So for example, I want to read data from an SQL server. I want to use a query. Query is already written in the server. Like we are learning how to write the queries. So once a query has been written, by doing all aggregations or any calculations there at the back end, that query I want to use to get that data into the Power BI. Okay, so then what I can do is just open this Power BI, click on get data. It will ask you from where you want to get the data, which type of data source. I'll say it should be a database of SQL Server. Say connect. It will ask you what is the server name. Okay, then what is the database name? Database name is EMP. You can click on advanced options. Here you can paste the SQL query. So I want to get this information from this database, from this server. Click on OK. It says this is the data available in your database. Say load data. So that data will be copied into the Power BI. Okay, it's not only copying the data, it is even maintaining a relationship, a connection to the server. Okay, it will load that data into the Power BI. 18 rows have been loaded now. But at any time, if I want, I can see this is the data presently loaded into the Power BI. But anytime, supposing new data has come into the 
our server. Simply, I can click on refresh. It is going to again fetch the latest data. Any new changes will be available here. And using this data, I can create different visualizations. Like say, I would like to know location-wise, how many employees are there. It will give first a simple table of data it has given each location who is the employees. But if I want to convert this into a visualization, a chart, I can create it. Seeing how many employees are there in each of the location, how many are there in Hyderabad, how many in Chicago. Similarly, I want to do it by any other columns, by job. I can also do an analysis by job wise, how many employees are there. Each job, how many employees. Like this, having a query, we can use it in different ways, in different visualizations. We can save this report. And the main strength of this Power BI is that this report can be easily shared with you. It can be saved in a cloud server. Microsoft provides us the option to save the reports on a cloud server so that they can be accessed from anybody from anywhere. You don't need to send this file. In Excel means we are going to send the Excel file to the end user, correct? We have to send it by a mail. But here in Power BI, we don't need to send mails. Once we save this to a cloud server, that can be viewed on a browser by anybody, anywhere, provided we give them the permissions access. When you share the report to any person, that person can see the report at his own convenience from any of the computers or the iPad or mobile for at his end. Okay, we need to only give him permissions to access. That's all. We don't need to send the files. This will be stored available on a cloud server and from there they can view that. So this is one main purpose of learning SQL is to be able to work on this type of reports, not only in Power BI, even in Tableau or any other application, you can access the data. Okay. Even in the Excel also, you can ret ret retrieve them. Probably I need to do some setup here. Once that is done, we can even import the data into an Excel. So this is a, what is the concepts or the basics of the SQL. It's uh, become, it has become very much a necessary now because everybody is storing the data on a database. Till now, we might be working on an Excel because somebody else, a IT team or somebody is importing data into the Excel and giving it to us. We are creating reports on that. But when you have got a tools, when you want to work on some tools like Power BI, where you want to take full control of the report, you want to get the data from original source so that it can be refreshed daily. In fact, Power BI provides an option to retrieve data and refresh the reports eight times in a day. So like that, if you want to show the latest report, latest information to the management, we need to have an access to the server. We should be able to create a report by connecting directly to the server, show the latest data on the reports and keep the management up to date so that they can make right decisions as per the requirement. If I, instead of showing one week old data or one day old data using SQL, I can easily show the latest data. And also if there is any change asked, we have to make some enhancements to the reports. Instead of we coordinating with the IT, taking the inputs from them, explaining them all the things can be avoided and we can directly make changes in the queries and display the data, okay? So this is the course. We are going to continue from tomorrow onwards. Tomorrow we'll start working on that. And uh, I would expect you to be ready with the downloads. And if you can install them, that is a very good thing so that Instead of just listening, tomorrow you can start working together with me. I'm going to give the dump file, data files. Also, we are going to work starting from the basics, how to create a database, how to add tables, how to add data into the tables, and then read the data. Okay? All the things will be learned. So if anybody wants to install now itself, I can help you. Otherwise, you can keep the files ready. Tomorrow I can set it up. So let me know if you have any questions. 
Anyways, uh, that's all from my side for today. If you are downloaded and not able to set up, please let me know, I can help you. Yeah, we'll be sharing the PDFs. You are going to share them through Google Drive. So we are going to create a shared folder wherein all the files will be added to that folder and you will be having access. Not only the PDFs, even the queries that we are going to write, everything will be shared with you so that you can, it will be easier for you to practice. Okay, thank you all for your time. See you all tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Just try to join on time so that it would be easier. It will be clear for you. If you join in the middle, it may be a bit confusing. So all of you try to join by 10 o'clock so that we can continue with this. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a good day, bye.